Hi, this is Stephen from Own a Disown. Now, I didn't like laptops, I've been all the rage for, for a while now, but they are finally filtering down to the gaming segment. And you must have recently heard about NVIDIA's uh, recent announcement about the Max Q requirements. So, surely we will have thin, quiet, and powerful GTX 1070 and 1080 models. In the meantime, Gigabyte has been pushing the envelope with the uh, AORUS line, like, uh, like this one here, um, the P series, and now the Aero line. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Aero 15. It's the big brother to the 14. Now, who is it for? It's for, it's for those people who want 1080p gaming in a thin, light and portable package. It is available in three colors. There's orange, the green one I have here, and uh, also black. It fits well into a business environment as well as if you're a student or even a coffee shop. It's 14 inches or 35 and a half centimeters long. 9 and 3 quarters or 25 centimeters in height, and it's actually only 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeters thick. Uh, total weight plus the 150 watt power brick is uh, 5.2 pounds or 2.3 kilos. The laptop by itself is only 4.1 pounds or 1.85 kilos, which is actually the same weight as this 13.9 inch aluminum AORUS X3 V7. So, how do they achieve this? Well, they use a combination of using plastic materials and shrinking down the chassis by reducing the bezels to five millimeters. Now, here's a comparison in size with the uh, Dell Inspiron 15 7000 Gaming, the 15 inch Lenovo Yoga and the AORUS X3 V7. It makes the 15 inch Dell look like a 17 inch in comparison, yet it has more powerful components. It is similar in size to, to the uh, Lenovo Yoga 720, but again, it has a much more powerful GPU in it. Only the 13.9 inch uh, AORUS X3 V7 because uh, it beat in specs and size. So indeed, I will be comparing uh, the Aero 15 to this. I will also compare the performance against the Scarlake Razer Blade 14, which I, I reviewed here. So let's take a look at its specs. It has an i7 uh, 700HQ quad-core CPU, turbo boosting all the way up to 3.8 gigahertz. It has a gorgeous 15.6 inch X-Rite Pantone certified anti-glare display. Now, x uh, Pantone certification means that the color accuracy is spot on out of the box. No need for calibration. I think that's, uh, that's great. Hallelujah. Now, it does support Optimus. So on battery, it uses the Intel HD 630 graphics. But for gaming, it has the GTX 1060 uh, GPU in it with six gigabytes of video RAM. This means you can enjoy both great battery life with its 94 watt hour battery and some serious gaming. It has two M.2 SSD slots that support both SATA and PCI Express. Now the included SSD is 512 gigabytes made by Lighton, and it is a SATA drive. Its speeds are on par with other SATA drives with a read speed of 540 megabytes per second and write speeds of 460 megabytes per second. The read speeds cannot compete with the drives in the Razer Blade or the uh, AORUS X3, but for everyday use, you probably won't notice and it does help keep costs down. It also has two DDR4 2400 MHz RAM slots. Now this one has only one stick, so it does run in, uh, in single channel, but you can uh, put another stick in there to get a maximum of 32 gigabytes. Now, it's nice that you can upgrade the RAM and add additional storage, but Gigabyte has tamper-proof screws. They told me if the end user breaks anything by gaining access to the internals, then your two-year warranty will be invalid. One must get a system builder to, uh, to do the upgrades. Now, the chances of damaging uh, anything is slim, but I must point out that some retailers say in their uh, return policy that the laptop must not be tampered with. So I suggest if you are gonna do some upgrades that you wait until uh, that return period is over. The Wi-Fi card used is uh, by Intel. It's the uh, dual band 8265, and actually I found it working very well. Now, it may have a plastic build construction, but it is very well built. There are no gaps, no creaks when you try and flex it. The screen, despite its thinness, is remarkably rigid too. Indeed, I think it looks rather elegant, especially if you choose a colored version. And the RGB keyboard with flashing away, I'm sure that you're gonna make all your co-workers quite jealous. The Gigabyte logo on the lid also glows white and it's actually tied to the brightness of the screen. So the only way, uh, you can't turn it off, but you can dim it by uh, lowering the brightness of the screen. So what does $1,900 get you, apart from a light and small laptop? The key thing that will draw you is its screen. Those five millimeter bezels provide a great viewing experience, and indeed, the color accuracy 
didn't need any calibration at all. Using my Spiderfy Pro, I got 68% uh, of NTSC, 73% of Adobe RGB, and 97% of sRGB. Interestingly, this was the same as the non x rite certified screen on the Aorus X3, and actually not far off that of the Razor Blade 14. The Aorus is much dimmer than the uh, Aero. Even with the Pantone setting activated, you still had a brighter screen. Here is a shot of the Aero 15 against the Lenovo 724K and the Aorus X3. It is the brightest of the bunch and gives the 4K Lenovo a good run for its money in my opinion. Here we take a look at how bright the screen is, 0%, 25%, 50%, 75% and back to 100% brightness. Light bleed was minimal, the camera actually makes this look worse than it actually is. The Aero 15 comes with software to select various presets. You can use the Pantone color preset which makes it a bit more blue than the, the native color. Now, within the native color, you can select four different temperatures, from 5,800K to uh, 6,800K. You can also alter the blue light, which, which makes the screen less uh, white for reading in low light. Now, viewing angles are excellent. There's no color shift at all, and even outdoors, it is very good with minimal reflections. Now, this is a stark contrast to the Yoga 720, which was like a mirror. The Aero 15 is also, uh, also doesn't skimp on ports. Now on the left hand side, you have a Ethernet jack, a USB 3.0 port, an HDMI 2 port, and a mini display port 1.3. On the right hand side, you have an SD card reader, Thunderbolt 3, two more USB 3 ports, and a Kensington lock. Now I'm really pleased to see an HDMI 2 and a mini display port 1.3. The last of which doubles the bandwidth, allowing the use of two 4K monitors. The HDMI 2.0 allows for 4K gaming at 60Hz. Now, unfortunately, the GTX 1060 on board here isn't powerful enough to take advantage of that. Now, since the bezels are so small and the only place to have a webcam is actually at the bottom of the, uh, the laptop here. Now, it has uh, an ambient light sensor in it as well, and that uh, alters the brightening, uh, brightness depending on the lighting conditions. So this is the webcam. And uh, as you can see, double chin shots on here, can't you really? Anyway, I'm holding this up, it's my daughter's made it, and I, I thought I'd pick it because of the different colours, whether you, you can see the colours clearly, you know, I think it'd be a good little test. Um, so, it's a 720p webcam, seems okay, it was a little bit dark, but anyway, thank you. Let's have a quick look underneath. Here we compare it to the Aorus X3, and I am pleased to see the large intake vents over where the two heat pipes are. Now, this should have been done on the Aorus, as it allows better compatibility with notebook coolers and generally allows for better airflow. Before I get into the benchmarks, let's see what those uh, thermals look like. First up are the average CPU temperatures, recorded during CPU only tests like my handbrake test, Cinebench, and my new Lightroom test. The Aero 15 uh, is quite cool at 77 degrees, just uh, slightly uh, below the Razor Blade 14, uh, which is a great performance considering it has a more powerful CPU and uh, it's much cooler than the more powerful Aorus X3. Now switching over to gaming, we see a different story. The GPU runs okay at an average of 80 degrees Celsius, which is on par with the Razer Blade, uh, but cooler than the Aorus X3. But the CPU gets quite hot when the normal fan is activated, averaging at 90 degrees, and it often throttles. Now within the Smart Manager software, you can choose four fan presets. Quiet fan, turns their fans off until the CPU reaches 61 degrees. Normal fan, which is idle, uh, which at idle is quiet at 19 decibels, but doesn't do a great job cooling the CPU. Gaming fan ramps up the speeds up to 4,114 RPM and 38 decibels. And finally, custom fan, which gives you more control, maxing out at 5,350 RPM and 48 decibels. So let's see what effect they have on temperatures. The gaming fan brings the CPU down by 3 degrees and the GPU down by 2 degrees. The max fan helps further, bringing both the CPU and GPU down by 6 degrees. And to be honest, 48 decibels isn't too loud and you can hear the game over them easily. Now another method is undervolting. I use throttle stop to do this. Applying a 150 millivolt uh, undervolt and using the normal fan, we get a 10 degree drop on the CPU and 4 degrees on the GPU. So let's take a look at chassis temperatures. The touchpad was at 28 degrees, AWSD keys at 26, center of the keyboard at toasty 41, number pad 29 degrees, and the back hinge area at 31 degrees. Underneath, we have at the front of the chassis was 32, but all on the back was a whopping 57 degrees. 
left and right, 33 degrees. Now I tried playing a game on my lap wearing shorts, and to be honest, it wasn't too bad. I think it's because it was quite light. But when you apply a bit of pressure with your hands, it certainly got pretty hot and it got too uncomfortable. Now, of course, these temperatures were measured at a room temp temperature of about 20 degrees Celsius. So I went out and played Grand Theft Auto V outside where the temperature was 27 degrees Celsius. With a normal fan, the CPU was the same at, uh, as the indoors at 92 degrees. Using the max fan outside saw the CPU rise to 89 degrees from 85 degrees uh, measured indoors. To simulate what it would be like using an external display with the lid closed, I, I, I gained it, did the outside test. Ambient temperature was 25 degrees this time. Now the CPU climbed to 92 degrees and the GPU to 86. As for the chassis temperatures, the back top surface was 34 degrees and underneath at the back, the same 57 degrees was uh, recorded. Now the laptop has two two watch speakers at the front. Now they aren't the loudest, but again, they're not the quietest I've heard. At 72 decibels, they were similar to the AOS X3, but louder than the Razer Blade. They were certainly quieter than the Yogo 720 though. Stephen from uh, Owner Disown, and uh, today we're going to take a look. Hi, this is Stephen from uh, Owner Disown, and uh, today we're going to take a look at it. I do wish they were louder, but you know what? You can hear any game action over them, so I think that's fair. That's good. And you can always use headphones, should you wish. So, and the sound through the headphones, I thought was very good. So let's take a look at the software. Initially, you are uh, greeted with a USB smart recovery software uh, so you can make up uh, a backup of your system. The software though, which, which you'll use mostly is Smart Manager and it is important that you update this straight away using the Smart Update Manager. Out of the box, there is a program called Empty Project 11 that is used to solve uh, Optus Optimus related lag. Now, unfortunately, it causes severe battery drain, but updating Smart Manager actually solves this. In Smart Manager, you can adjust the volume, brightness, change power mode, turn off uh, on or off Wi Fi, Bluetooth, the camera, the touchpad. You can alter the mouse speed, adjust screen color, alter the fan speeds, and open the Smart Dashboard. Now, in the Smart Dashboard, you can see the GPU clock, CPU clock, memory being used, the power scheme temperatures, uh, then the fan speed, and various network information. I think it's a very handy utility. You can use Gigabyte Fusion to create macros and to alter the keyboard lighting. To create a macro, you click on the key you want to assign, then you press uh, Record New. Click Record, then press the Assign key. You then move over to the apps and select uh, or add the one you want, and uh, you're good to go. It would have been nice to have a dedicated macro uh, row like, uh, like on the uh, AOS, but they decided to put a separate number pad. They obviously thought that was more important. What do you guys think? Next, we have the light control option. You have a number of set options to choose from. For example, you can choose static and select the color you want and change the brightness using the slider. The brightness can also be changed using the FN plus spacebar. There are three presets. There's off, medium, and high. You can select themes such as breathing, wave, or even rotate a rotating pan, which I personally thought looked pretty cool. You can also create a custom profile by changing the colors of the individual keys or by selecting a profile such as a first person shooter game. So it uh, enables a color scheme to suit. Now, continuing on to the, uh, the keyboard and trackpad, it has a good uh, distance of uh, travel and uh, has good tactile feedback. There is some degree of uh, keyboard flex, but that's not uncommon. You do have a separate number pad and a quick access uh, to the F key functions like screen brightness, volume controls, and airplane mode. Now, I did have reports that the keyboard was off-centered, so I compared it to my Yoga 720. And indeed, the touchpad does seem to be a little bit further to the right, so your hand is more likely to touch it when typing. I also had reports that some key combinations didn't register a press. And indeed, Whilst pressing the left control and shift and the bottom keys together, it failed to register. Now pressing the, uh, pressing the keys further up the keyboard or pressing those lower keys individually worked just fine. I think the touchpad is the weakest point. It's made of plastic. It's very smooth though, which is okay, but I felt that it sat very flush to the rest of the palm rest, so it was, it was hard to click in the right place sometimes. The AOS X3 has, uh, has a texture feel to the uh, mouse button area, which certainly helped you uh, locate it and click better. It uses Elan drivers, so tracking was okay, but not great. Out of the box, two-finger scrolling was okay, 
albeit slow, but pincer zoom was rather poor. Now, to be fair, you can change many of these settings in the ELAN software, which does help it. I was asked to look at uh, using Windows Precision Drivers and installed uh, Cross Touchpad 4 and uh, the ELAN WDF driver as per these instructions. But unfortunately, I just could not get them to work. All right, so Gigabyte touts that the Aero 15 has all day battery life and indeed with a whopping 94 watt hour battery, it, it should do. It supports Optimus too, so it should automatically switch to the Intel graphics. For the latest Smart Manager install, I got six hours, 53 minutes during my YouTube streaming uh, with 25% screen brightness, power and battery saver activated. Now this is good, but to be honest, I did expect a bit better. Uh, I expected better than the 73 watt hour AOS X3, which ran six and a half hours uh, and has a faster processor on it. Now it has uh, slightly better than the Razer 14, but it, uh, that has a 70 watt hour battery. Now I suspect it's due to the brighter display on this model. If you do undervolt it by 150 millivolts and turn Bluetooth off, you do get seven and a half hours. Now, that is more like it. With the notebook powered off, you can check the uh, level of the battery by pressing uh, the uh, bottom right hand corner of the touchpad and a series of lights uh, light up. Very useful. Let's look at the power bricks. The razor blade comes with a 165 watt power supply, but Gigabyte use a 150 watt one. Understandably, they use the same one for the AOS X3. Now gaming typically pulls about 110 watts, so you should be okay. But if you really, really push your system like I did with Prime 95 and Furmark, you can see that we are getting close to that 150 watt limit. Now bear in mind, you can also charge things on the USB port on the power supply. Now, not that a phone uses that much power, but it's something to be aware of. Okay, so let's cut to the chase and look at some benchmarks. For my overclock tests, I increased the core by 212 megahertz and the memory by 366 megahertz. Battlefield 1 runs well, it's fluid and looks great on this display. You can play nicely at, uh, at all the settings. <laughs> On average, you get about 52 FPS, which falls slightly behind the razor blade, but it's uh, but much further behind the AOS X3, which has a faster CPU. Overclocking it did help by about 8%. Grand Theft Auto 5 also looked and played well. Running at near max settings, we get about 94 FPS, which is fantastic. It matches the more powerful AOS X3. Mafia 3 is another open world game, but it's not the most optimized game, uh, but the updates have improved it. I think those updates can be seen in the difference between the Razer Blade, which I reviewed uh, some time ago, uh, and, the, and the rest of the systems here. Still, there was not much to choose between the AOS X3 and the Aero 15, you know, perhaps 5% at most, 50 FPS, I think, is good uh, for this game at high settings. I often show the inbuilt benchmark in Rainbow Six Siege, so I include some gameplay here for you. It looks great again on this display. <laughs> now at max settings, we get 51 FPS, so again, splitting the Razer Blade and the AOS X3. Overclocking uh, gives us an extra 10% once more. In Rise of the Tomb Raider, we see the best performance yet. At stock, we get an average of 66 FPS, which is the same as the IOs, but overclocking again yields a nice 10% boost. In Firestrike, the Aero performs the same as the Razor Blade, but it cannot keep up with the faster IOs, although overclocking does help it gain some ground. So let's move on to some CPU tests. I used uh, Adobe Lightroom to convert 50 photos to a video uh, slideshow with, uh, with music. The Aero 15 took uh, 16 minutes 30 seconds and the Aor Aorus X3 took about 16 minutes. Uh, so that's only about a 2% difference, so I think it's pretty close. In Cinebench R15, the Aero 15 performs right where an i7-700HQ should be. But of course, it cannot beat the uh, overclockable CPU in the Aorus. Finally, another real test. Handbrake, converting a 4 gigabyte video file to MP4, I measured the time taken. The Aero 15 performs very well, but you can see the advantage of clock speed on the AORUS X3. It shaves off 4 minutes, or about 10%. Alright, so to conclude, there was much to like about this uh, gigabyte uh, Aero 15. The build quality is solid, it's very pleasing to the eye, 
Um, you can upgrade key components such as RAM, storage, and it has all the most up-to-date ports that you could want. It performs well and runs cool if you apply an undervolt, but uh, the underside does get rather warm, so please bear that in mind. Battery life, although less than I expected, will still last you most of the day. The speakers are okay, could be better, but fan noise is mineral, and you can have zero fan noise using the quiet mode should you wish. Now, thanks for watching. Thumbs up if you like, subscribe if you want to see some more, and I'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye.